The next account of metaphor that we'll talk about is the Gricean or the implicature view of metaphor. And on the Gricean or implicature view, the idea is that, well, when you use a sentence metaphorically, you're really just implicating something other than what the sentence says. So remember last week when we talked about implicature, implicature is a way of going beyond what a sentence says to say, to say something more. On Grice's theory of implicature, the way that happens is by violating maxims, or by seeming to violate maxims. The audience presupposes that the speaker is trying to be cooperative, so the speaker is trying to be is trying to follow the maxims. When they say something which ap appears to violate the maxims, the audience tries to reinterpret what they're saying or find some additional content that they might be trying to communicate, which would mean that they really are following the maxims after all. How might metaphor fit into all of this? Well, if you think about it, as we said at the very beginning, in cases of metaphor, very often what people are saying are things that are literally false. Juliet is li not literally the sun. History is not literally a nightmare that Stephen Dedalus is trying to awake from. Neither of these things are literally true. And this kind of fits in well with a Gricean or an applicature based approach to, to metaphor. Because your thought might be that, well, when somebody says something literally false like that, the Gricean account will predict that they'll go looking for some other meaning, something else that the speaker could have had in mind. And if they can find something like that, they'll reinterpret the speaker as trying to say that. And that is basically what the Gricean view says. When we use a sentence metaphorically, we're breaking maxims. That leads the audience to try and re reinterpret what we're saying. And so they instead come up with a different kind of content which is the metaphorical content that we're trying to get across. Let's go through that a little bit more concretely with a specific example. So take the example, man is a wolf. Suppose I say that to you. Here is basically what happens on the implicature account of metaphor. The first stage is the audience recognizes that's false. See, it's literally false. But of course, if I'm saying something literally false, then I'm violating the maxim of quality that we talked about before. The maxim of quality says, don't say false things. And here I, I appear to be saying a false thing, and so I appear to be breaking a maxim. So the next step is the audience presupposes the speaker is cooperative. Or is following CP. Now, this generates attention because if I'm saying this, which is literally true, but I'm also following the cooperative principle, then the audience has to conclude I must be saying something other than what the sentence literally says. So that leads the audience to search for a new meaning, search for additional content I, should, I could be communicating, or a replacement really in this case. How do they actually move from that to finding what I actually mean? Well, just like in other cases of implicature, what they do is they use their background knowledge of the situation and of the speaker to come up with the best possible interpretation that doesn't violate the maxims. So from there, they use background knowledge to come up with an interpretation that doesn't violate the maxims. Or indeed CP. What might that be in this case? How would it actually work in the case of a specific metaphor like this? Well, the idea is basically the background knowledge in this case is, you know, what people think about wolves, how people think about wolves, what stereotypes you might attribute to wolves. And the picture seems to be something like, well, it's everybody knows that wolves are generally thought to be predatory and vicious. And so in a particular kind of scenario, it might seem like a good interpretation of what the speaker is saying to, say, to think that, well, what they're saying is that 
man has these properties that are attributed to wolves, namely of being predatory and vicious. What the speaker is really saying is humans are predatory and vicious. And the reason that the audience comes to that conclusion is because, well, they see the sentences that are false, but they presuppose the speaker is, is being cooperative, so they look for a new meaning. And the new meaning they come up with is based on background knowledge. And the kind of background knowledge that's relevant in this case will tend to be stereotypical features of wolves and things like that. So that's sort of a sketch of how the Gricean theory works. And it has a number of advantages, just like our other accounts had a number of advantages. The first advantage is that it gives a very clear answer to the second question we talked about. Our second question was, do our metaphors used to make assertions or, they do some, or do they do something else? And on the Gricean picture, metaphors do make assertions. Because think about normal examples of implicature, like the professor has lovely handwriting. That's used to indirectly assert that the professor is not a good lecturer. So implicatures are a way of asserting, of saying that something is the case without directly saying that it's the case. If we think that metaphors are just another example of implicature, then the Gricean account is going to be saying that metaphors too are ways of saying that something is the case. They're ways of making assertions, but ways of making assertions that go beyond, or in this case actually just ignore, the original content of the sentence. So that's one good feature. The second good feature is that, in a way, it's, it's nice to try and reduce metaphor to something that we have a relatively good understanding of already. So not everybody agrees with all the details of Grice's theory of implicature, but a lot of people agree with the general idea that implicatures come out of this reasoning about each other based on the presumption of cooperation, or something along those lines. So implicature, you might think, is relatively well understood. If metaphor is itself a form of implicature, then that yields a nice theory of metaphor, because we have a pretty good theory of implicature. If metaphor is implicature, then that means we'll also have a pretty good theory of metaphor, a fairly well worked out theory, you might think. So that's the second advantage. The final advantage as well is that the potential meanings that we might come up with in the process of trying to, to figure out how the speaker could be being cooperative, the actual things you might be understood to be saying when you use a metaphor are potentially much, much richer than on the simile account. So we saw that a serious problem on the simile account is that with particularly complex examples, it's really hard to find a simile that conveys the same thing as that rich metaphor. On the Gricean account, we, it doesn't need to be a simile. We could be communicating or could be understood to be communicating things other than similes. It might not be a simile. That's the best explanation of why the speaker violated the maxim of quality. So we can potentially come up with much more interesting meanings that the speaker could have had in mind using the Gricean theory. We're not constrained to say that it's only these very kind of uninteresting similes that must be being communicated. And that does seem like an important advantage of the Gricean theory over the simile theory. Nonetheless, again, there are some problems with this account. So one problem is that the whole thing that's supposed to kick off the reinterpretation of a metaphor is this idea that, well, the sentence is literally false. In this example of man as a wolf, well, obviously he's not literally a wolf. So on the applicature account, we go looking for a different meaning because we assume that they're following CP, at least as a default assumption, but what, they have what they've actually said is literally false, so we think there must be something else in mind. But this first thing doesn't always hold. It's not actually always true that a sentence that generates a metaphor is literally false. There is this phenomenon of what people call metaphors that are true twice over, where both the literal content and the metaphorical content are true at the same time. There's a nice example in the paper you read of the sentence, Anchorage is a cold city. So Anchorage is located in Alaska, so you might suppose Anchorage really is cold. But we can imagine somebody saying that sentence, saying that Anchorage is a cold city, to kind of say two things at once, to say it's a cold place literally, and it's also a cold place temperamentally. We can imagine somebody saying both of those two things at once, where the, and where the second one, importantly, is metaphorical. It's not totally clear how that fits into the Gricean picture, because remember, it was supposed to be that what kicks off the, the process of looking for a metaphorical interpretation is that the sentence is literally false. That's obviously not necessarily the case in the, in the example of Anchorage is a cold city. Most people would, attend, would tend to assume that that's true, and so 
you might think this 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 process of looking for a metaphorical meaning should never get started in the first place. So that's the first prima facie problem for the implicature account. Not all metaphors are actually literally false. What the Gricean account would have to say in this case is that actually there's a different maxim that's being violated that kicks off the process of looking for a metaphorical interpretation. You might think it might be something like relevance. Remember we said that relevance is a maxim as well. When you say things that are irre irrelevant, that also initiates the process of looking for an implicature. So you might say that in the example of Anchorage is a cold city, maybe what you've literally said is irrelevant, and so you go looking for, an, for a metaphorical meaning as well. That may or may not do. It depends on whether you think that in every single case where you're able to use the sentence Anchorage is a cold city metaphorically, is it, is it true that in every single case the literal meaning is irrelevant? That's not totally clear. But there are some ex options here for the Gricean to explore. The second complaint people have made about the Gricean theory is kind of in the step from three to four. So the explanation is pretty concrete up until this point about what's going on. So the audience sees that the sentence is literally false in this case. Let's just focus on the literal falsehood cases for now. Set aside the Anchorage cases. So we see that the sentence is literally false. The audience presupposes the speaker is following CP. That leads them to search for an additional meaning. All of this is relatively straightforward and easy to understand what's supposed to be going on here. By contrast, the move from three to four, you might worry, is actually kind of vague. We talk about sort of coming up with background knowledge, using to come up to an interpretation. Maybe in some cases we can sort of say how that works. But it's really kind of vague, and it doesn't really issue any concrete predictions. It's hard to, it's hard to use this theory and give it a, a specific sentence and just come up with a particular interpretation that the person might have been after. Put it differently, the theory doesn't say a lot in detail about how we actually use background knowledge to come up with the metaphor. It get, you might worry that it gets kind of really kind of hand-wavy at this point. This is one of the main complaints that Reimer and Camp report in the paper that you read for this week. I myself am not totally sure how fair a charge this is, partly because this is just a general feature of implicature. Implicature is extremely context sensitive. It really matters a lot what is actually true in the situation where the sentence is being said. It matters a lot what everybody is presupposing is true, what the background information is. So I think it's just a fact about Grice's theory of implicature that it's hard to get con con concrete predictions for any kind of implicature in lots of cases unless you know a lot about the actual context in which the sentence was said. So this objection that the, step, the move from step th three to step four of using the background knowledge to come up with a specific interpretation, the charge that this is very vague, the charge that it's hard to use this to predict what kinds of metaphors you will get. I don't know, totally know if I think this lands myself because it's just part of Grice's theory that we actually need to know a lot about the background knowledge in the context before we're able to say what, the, what actually is predicted to be the, the meaning. It might well be the case though that even when we supply all the background knowledge in, this, in the particular kind of context, even if we could spell out in this case everything that we held fixed in the background, it might still be hard to come up with a specific metaphorical meaning. Because remember, on the Gricean account, it has, there has to be some particular thing, some, there, some one proposition that the speaker was saying that we can use to, that we, to reinterpret their utterance so that they're seen to be following CP. It may be that when we spell out the details, that's hard to do. It may be that it really is hard to find one thing that the speaker could be doing that would mean that they follow CP. That could be a problem, but to really figure that out, we need to look at the details. I don't think it's enough just to say that this step is vague and then leave the concern at that. How implicatures work is always sort of vague. It's always very context sensitive. You have to look a lot at the case to know whether it's going to work. The final kind of problem for this account, and it's sort of a problem we've seen for the simile account as well, is that this account predicts that a metaphor should be expressible in non in, in non metaphorical language, you might think. Because what happens in a case of implicature? Well, when we when we reinterpret somebody as trying to implicate something, 
we find some other thing they could be trying to communicate and we attribute that to them. We say, well, when man, when somebody says man is a wolf, they're trying to communicate something else like man is predatory or man is vicious, something like that. And in general, when we implicate things, it's not because there's no way of trying to say what we, what we want to say. It's just because implicating is just a better way to say it. So remember in the handwriting example, when I say, when the person says the professor has lovely handwriting, they say that and thereby implicate what they mean, not because they couldn't have said it directly. They could have equally well said David Boylan is a terrible professor, and that would very well communicate what they had in mind. It's just they don't want to say it directly. But, so, but usually in, it, with implicatures, it is possible to say directly what somebody says indirectly with an implicature. The worry with an implicature-based account of metaphor is that it's not always totally clear you can do this with a metaphor. It's not always totally clear that you can find a non-metaphorical way of saying exactly the same thing as the metaphor was trying to say. Now, sometimes you can, like in very simple examples. We saw the example of, like, life is a journey. That's a very simple metaphor and maybe is one that could be expressed in non-metaphorical language. But when we think about some of the other more complex examples of metaphors, they are seem much more difficult to express in non-metaphorical language. Like, think about the various Shakespeare lines we've talked about. The one about the blood boiling and the tongue becoming prodigal. That, we could give a sense of what that's supposed to mean in non-metaphorical language. But we only were really able to give a sense. We weren't, I, I, it's not really clear we were able to exactly say in non-metaphorical language exactly the same thing as the metaphor said. And that's kind of surprising in the Gricean account. Because it is supposed to be that there's a specific proposition we've come up with that we're that they're implicating. So the question is, well, why can't we just say that in non-metaphorical language? Why in certain cases is it so hard to find a literal way of saying the exact same thing as a metaphor does? That's kind of a worry for this account. It's a kind of worry for any account where saying something metaphorically is a way of asserting something. If you really are just asserting something, then why could, shouldn't it always be the case that you could do the same thing in non-metaphorical literal language? You might expect that you could. You might expect that there should be always a literal way of saying the same thing, of saying exactly the same thing. But that's not totally clear. In these cases of very rich metaphors, it's not totally clear whether we can find literal ways of expressing exactly the same thing as we have in mind. We can sort of gesture at it, we can capture elements of it, but it's sort of an open question whether in all cases you could always say the same thing. And that might be a problem for the Gricean approach. So in this video, we talked about the implicature-based account of metaphor. On the implicature-based account of metaphor, the idea is simple. It's just that when you use a sentence metaphorically, you're communicating something extra because you're implicating something extra. And we saw last time, when we talked about implicature last week, we saw how that's supposed to happen. The idea is, well, when you say a sentence that's meant metaphorically and non-literally, your speaker spots that it's false, but they presuppose you're being cooperative. And that initiates this process of trying to find a different thing you could be communicating that could be what, you're, what you really want your audience to believe. And then it's supposed to be that the audience uses their background knowledge to figure out an, an, an appropriate meaning that the speaker could have in mind. And often they'll latch on to like stereotypical or typically attributed features of things like wolves or the sun or, or whatever kind of object is in question in the metaphor. So that was the implicature-based account of metaphor. We talked about three problems. So one problem is that the thing that's supposed to kick it off of the metaphor being literally false is not actually true in all cases of metaphor. There are these cases of metaphors that are true twice over. They're true literally, and the metaphorical content is maybe also true. We also talked about the worry that the final step is rather vague. The Gricean account, it doesn't say very much at all about how we specifically use the background knowledge to come up with a meaning that doesn't violate the cooperative principle. It just says, well, the speaker figures it out somehow. And some people think that this is a problem with the Gricean view. As I said, I'm not totally sure how much I buy this criticism because this just seems to be a general feature of implicature. Until you know exactly what's going on in the situation, you can't really say much in detail at a very high level about how implicature works. So we really need to think through the details of individual cases of metaphor to figure out really how much of a problem this, the vagueness of this step is. 
The final thing we talked about with this was this worry that maybe metaphors can't be expressed or can't always be expressed in non-literal language. That would be kind of surprising on the Gricean account because there is a particular thing that you're trying to communicate. There's a particular proposition or a particular thought that you have and you want your audience to share. According to the implicature account, that's something you're trying to do and you're trying to do it through an implicature. The problem is that in certain very rich cases of metaphor, it's hard to find what that proposition is. Certainly it seems very difficult with some of these Shakespeare examples to say in non-metaphorical literal language, what exactly is the thought that you're trying to share? And that's kind of surprising from the point of view of the Gricean theory. This particular, this last objection is particularly important, this idea about are, can, ex, can metaphors be expressed? Can you say the exact same thing in non-metaphorical speech? And it's going to kick off the view we're going to examine in the next video, or in the bulk of the next video, which is the non-cognitive approach to metaphor.